you know, imagery is incredibly powerful. And today we're pushing the boundaries and people are having higher expectations of brands, which is why it's also important to be conscious of how visual imagery is being used because people want and people are expecting images to represent themselves and the world that they see around them. And they want those images to be authentic and they want those images to also have integrity and they want those images to also have integrity. Welcome to Inclusion and Marketing, a show that's all about helping you develop the skills and insights you need to win the attention, adoration and loyalty of more consumers, especially those with differences that are often ignored by brands. I'm your host, Sonia Thompson, an inclusive brand coach, strategist, and a person with a lot of differences. Let's get to it. When it comes to building an inclusive brand, it is essential that you have an inclusive internal culture. There's a lot of nuance with building a company culture that is ripe for making your team, including your diverse talent, feel like they belong. So to help you with all those nuances, I recommend you take a listen to the Truth, Lies, and Workplace Culture podcast hosted by Al and Leanne Elliott. It's all about helping you find, keep, and motivate the great people you bring on your team. I listened to an episode recently all about quiet quitting that is super relevant to your ability to retain the diverse talent that you worked so hard to attract. There's lots of good stuff to dig into with this show. Listen to Truth, Lies, and Workplace Culture wherever you get your podcasts. Visual imagery plays a critical role in communicating to consumers, especially those with differences, whether or not a brand is for them. If they see themselves represented in a manner that feels right for them, it gives them permission to take the next step forward with you and your brand. If people don't see themselves represented, it gives them the information they need to go off in search of another option to get their needs met. Visual imagery and making it more representative is often the on-ramp for many brands into inclusive marketing. And while in recent years, a broader range of stock photography and videos has become available showcasing more diverse faces, body types, and families, simply changing up your imagery to include more diverse people isn't automatic in terms of making them feel like they belong with you. So to help you know how to ensure that the visual imagery and in particular the stock photography that you're using is inclusive, I chatted with Deira J. Fontaine, an inclusive marketing strategist and certified diversity, equity, and inclusion practitioner who has done a lot of work in the area of inclusive stock photography and she's even created a really handy guide on it more about that later for now let's dive into this super rich conversation with david j hey david j thank you so much for joining me today how are you i'm doing well thank you so much for having me i'm really happy to be here Oh, it's my pleasure. My pleasure. Um, All right. Well, I'm excited about the topic we're going to cover today. But first, let's tune the people into who are you and what do you do? All right. Well, uh, my full name is Dara J. Fontaine, and I'm based in Canada. I'm an inclusive marketing strategist, and my job is basically to help organizations leverage their authentic brand values to transform their marketing in a way that helps them amplify marginalized voices and better serve underrepresented communities. Very important, um, as we all know here. So I'm glad that you are um, sharing in um, making sure that we are able to do that here. All right. So we want to talk a lot about representation today, in particular in marketing and in visual imagery. From your perspective, why is it so important? Well, I think that, first of all, proper representation is an essential component in building equality and then ultimately equity overall. And I think it's important to remember that we live in such a hyper visual world. And it's really easy to forget how much influence the imagery we consume each and every day has this power to um, shape how we see ourselves and the world around us. So visual imagery is important for that reason because it can help to reinforce and it can even help change our perceptions of ourselves and the people that we see in the world every day. And I think that as a society, 
for the past few decades, we've consumed or absorbed such negative stereotypical and one dimensional images of different types of communities, whether that was racialized persons or disabled persons or um, 2S LGBTQ plus persons or others. Those images that we've been absorbing for these past couple of decades again and again help to normalize inaccurate and harmful depictions of people that then end up getting carried out into the real world. And so what we need to do now as a society and what we've prioritized, I think, or we're starting to as marketers is helping to change those quote unquote normalized images that were negative or more harmful into more positive representations of these marginalized or underrepresented communities moving forward. Absolutely. Um, I'm glad you brought up just about how the imagery, images that we see influence not only how people think of themselves, but also how other people view people who are part of those groups. So um, almost two years ago, wow, almost two years ago, we moved back we, well, we moved from Argentina to Florida, and Florida is where I grew up. And I um, sometimes whenever I go pick up my daughter from my parents' house, the news is on, and I'll watch the news, and I'm always so disappointed whenever I see it. It feels like there is a disproportionate um, representation of crimes by people of color that are being shown on the news versus just overall. So maybe it's a feel good story or it's, um, they're calling for help, you know, with a consumer sort of um, um, issue that they're having. Those aren't necessarily people of color that I'm seeing. And I was, I take notice of it and I just feel like, wow, what are the message that they're sending about people of color, people who are part of these communities, when the imagery that they're seeing, particularly on this news station, is that they have create, committed some kind of crime versus they were a hero or something was happening. Mm -hmm. So I think it really does exist in a lot of different places. And we probably do need to recognize as brands, the power that we have in the choices that we are making with regards to the imagery we're putting forth. Absolutely. And what you're saying reminds me of something because I, I studied journalism as an undergrad. And so that's my background. And I worked in a few newsrooms as an intern and, and as summer jobs and things like that. And um, here, um, one of the things that was so off putting for me, actually not even going into my undergrad, but in high school as well, is the lack of um, representation within the newsroom and then how that trickled into the way the news was represented. For example, where I'm from in, in the land we now know as Canada, there are a lot of Indigenous people. And so anytime that there was a news story about crime, similarly, the editor would always ask, the very first question the editor would ask would be, was it an Indigenous person who committed the crime? because of that preconceived notion that existed and that has been perpetuated by the media in the region that I'm from. So it's very deeply ingrained and it comes out almost, you know, whether people are conscious or not, it does perpetuate these negative stereotypes that we have in our, in our minds. And it's not only stereotypes, uh, well, it's, it's mostly stereotypes, but it's not just the media in terms of the news media, but any type of visual imagery that we see, I think has the power to influence and shape our perceptions of others and ourselves. I think of um, a good example is Aunt Jemima, um, you know, mm -hmm. the very popular, famous table syrup brand. Um, it was around forever since the 1920s. I think that brand has existed and the mascot of Aunt Jemima is based on a, a racist stereotype from the southern U.S., but it's been on syrup bottles for decades and decades. And for some people, it's just an inane image of this smiling black woman on their bottles of table syrup while they devour their pancakes. And even though the company tried to modernize that image from like the mammy stereotype mm -hmm. into something like less racist, uh, it was still rooted in a racist origin. And so people called for that to change. And finally, PepsiCo, which owns that brand today, 
finally renamed their their Aunt Jemima um, brand to the Pearl Milling Company. But what we, you know, can learn from that is people were having their breakfast every day and seeing this image, which they thought was so normal. So then it became normal, for example, for white people to go out and paint their face black and dress up as Aunt Jemima for Halloween. Or it was okay for kids to make fun of like little black girls in the schoolyard and call them Aunt Jemima because consciously or not, there was an association being made between images of black women and girls as being these subservient people. So, you know, imagery is incredibly powerful. And today we're pushing the boundaries and people are having higher expectations of brands, which is why it's also important to be conscious of how visual imagery is being used because people want and people are expecting images to represent themselves and the world that they see around them. And they want those images to be authentic and they want those images to also have integrity. So Absolutely. It's Absolutely. Absolutely. I, um, I always say like people want to see themselves or who they aspire to be reflected in the visual imagery that they're seeing. Right. So it needs mm-hmm. to be something that, um, is reflective of them or, um, something that they're not trying to get away from, right. Or leave behind. So that was a wonderful example. Thanks. Um, all right. Well, let's talk a little bit about stock photography because stock photography is often a vehicle many brands use to communicate from a visual standpoint. Whenever you know they don't have the budget, or whenever um, to create sort of custom photography. Um, so, what I've started to see this term used more and more lately. What is inclusive stock photography? Yeah, good question, because it's true that stock photos are used everywhere and companies of all different sizes will continue to use them um, for the foreseeable future, if not forever. So um, unlike conventional stock photos, I would say inclusive stock photos are ones that actually take a step to, to accurately represent the diversity of the world around us. So that means that those images, which are prepackaged in the same way that other stock photo images are, they are just free of stereotypes, they are free of superficiality and tone deafness and cultural insensitivity. So they will feature models or subjects that are from these underrepresented or marginalized communities in real settings that actually represent their true lived experiences rather than um, something that's preconceived or inaccurate. So the images are sure not to tokenize or misrepresent people from these marginalized groups, such as indigenous peoples, um, persons of color, racialized individuals, persons with disabilities, um, members of the 2SLGBTQ plus community, among many others. So that's the difference with inclusive stock photography. It's really, it's really, um, as I've started to see more of it, you know, you see that it's not just about having one, like you said, tokenizing and having like one person of color in the group mm-hmm. or just having like a wide ver- variety of hands <laughs> of yeah. different colors um, in the photo. So I'm, I'm happy to see that it's starting to become more nuanced and authentic. What are... Um, some of the stereotypes because you mentioned stereotypes previously about that commonly exist in the visual imagery and and particularly in stock photography what are can you talk a little bit about some of those stereotypes that you see present in visual imagery particularly from a marketing standpoint and how brands should be thinking about them and incorporating that into their strategy yeah i think it's just we have to be really honest stock photos are are pretty cringy in general right so (laughs) it's tough finding really good stock images it takes a lot of time it takes a lot of effort i think the problem is when we start to see the images that are of people falling outside of what we consider to be the dominant culture they're reduced to a few select characteristics that are based on these preconceived notions that we mentioned earlier so for example you are probably going to find it really difficult to um, find an image of an indigenous person just existing at work or the mall or like the grocery store or something like that 
wherever the case may be. The only images you'll tend to see are like indigenous people in their regalia as if indigenous peoples um, only exist in ceremony or as like relics of the past. Or another example, just to, to point out how stereotypes come to fruition is like if you search for mom on a traditional stock photo site, the first thing you're gonna notice is that probably most of the moms are, you know, young, thin, what we would consider conventionally attractive and white. Um, if you want an image of a mom who isn't white, you have to put those qualifiers into your search terms. You probably aren't gonna see um, moms that are, you know, like a two mom household, a same sex couple as moms. Again, you're gonna need to modify your search terms because the default mom is probably that mom, as I described, playing with her baby, cuddling her kids, or she's in the kitchen or something like that. And that's because the stereotype of moms being this servant to her children and the home is still very much alive. If you want another, you know, take on mom, then you're going to have to put qualifiers in like working mom. And then you'll see a mom doing something other than existing in the home. So these things exist all the time in imagery. I think the lack of certain images actually tells us more about the state of stock ph photography. Um, if you go into a major stock photo site and you were to search terms like, or if you were looking for a black university professor or a woman in a hijab in a boardroom or someone in a wheelchair in a science lab or like a South Asian lawyer, those images are probably going to be harder to find because they're not the default. And though some me some people mar might argue that those types of things sound specific, but I would argue it's the fact that we don't consider them as default possibilities. That's the problem. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think about it even from a personal standpoint. Um, my, my husband is Argentine. We have a mixed race daughter. And um, whenever you look at imagery of a family, rarely do you see a mixed race family, right? Mm -hmm. You might see a child that looks racially ambiguous just, or a person who looks racially ambiguous. And we can talk about that a little bit more um, later, but you don't necessarily see a family that is a blend of cultures or that isn't two black people, two white people, two, um, an Asian family, you know, you don't, you see the groupings, but you don't necessarily see the mixing of it. And then mm -hmm. in the rare case that you do see it, it's really not a black mom and a white husband or a black mom and, you know, somebody from another race. It's, you know, always kind of the other way around. And that I feel like is telling too and perpetuates some negative stereotypes as well. Absolutely. Yeah. And so I think our job as marketers is to be aware of those things. The fact that these, um, I, I keep saying preconceived notions, but the fact that these preconceived notions exist of what a family is or what a teacher is, what a certain profession looks like, we have to be aware of those biases when we're going out and we're choosing stock images because the power we have as marketers is to challenge them and to help move our visual language forward in changing what those perceptions are within our society. Absolutely. So I completely agree. Mm -hmm. I've been guilty of overcomplicating things and doing the unnecessary in my business more than a few times over the years. No bueno. But as I've grown and have started leaning more heavily into my values, including the one that's all about that tranquilo life, there's no room for overcomplicated and unnecessary. So as I evaluate how to streamline the way I work, it's important that the tools and solutions I use are both simple and streamlined as they work to help me reach my goals. HubSpot integrates sales, marketing, and customer experience all in one place, which makes for an uncomplicated and unfussy experience. Want to know something else cool about HubSpot that aligns perfectly with my Tranquilo values? With HubSpot, you can try before you buy. No commitment, no hidden fees, not even a credit card is needed to sign up. Talk about uncomplicated and a peaceful experience. 
Yeah. Learn how HubSpot can help your business grow better at HubSpot.com. What are some other common mistakes that you've seen brands making as it relates to them working to diversify their visual imagery? I think the biggest mistake that I see is the token the the tokenism that you mentioned. Throwing in most of the time it's a racialized model into the mix to to check off that diversity box. You know, for the past couple of years we saw a lot of brands promising to do better because there was so much societal pressure on them to, you know, help remove systemic racism and be more inclusive. But a lot of those brands have fallen short because they're ticking the box rather than fully um, taking stock around the practices that they have within their organization and particularly within marketing departments. So the biggest problem is that tokenistic gesture of throwing in, like I said, predominantly a racialized model into the mix and saying that you're doing inclusive marketing or that you're being representative within your marketing. Um, it's not about just having a racialized model there. That's not what we expect when we talk about representation. It's lovely, sure, that we're seeing more racialized people in media, but their, present is, their presence isn't enough to satisfy those calls for representation because representation isn't just about you know being a face in the room it's also about having a voice right so i think that's the the biggest challenge or the 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 biggest fumble that i tend to see is when those things are done because people see right through it and if you have people in a workroom selecting images in that manner it's really going to come across as inauthentic because it is inauthentic. And those people selecting the images, if you're not representing the communities that you're portraying and you're attempting to serve, then I don't think that you're ever going to be able to overcome that hurdle of truly understanding what your audience wants, truly understanding how your audience needs to see themselves, how they need to be spoken to, what their needs are, what their desires are. And that's um, because we don't see um, a lot of changes in terms of the creative workrooms where these images are put together. So I think that's one of the biggest hurdles we have within the, the marketing industry right now. Absolutely. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on whether or not, so as brands are thinking about creating marketing policies that kind of go around um, or brand guidelines um, that help guide their use of what their photography should look and feel like. Should they also be creating some sort of guidelines as to, um, for instance, the giving using the example that you said before, if we're showcasing um, an indigenous person, um, they should be in everyday life not in um, just more ceremonial sort of um, clothing. Or if we're showcasing um, a family, we need to make sure that we have a wide variety of what a family could look like because it looks very, it can look in a multitude of ways. If we're sourcing um, photos of women working, we need to make sure that we're reflecting women who incorporate different cultures as well or religion religions as well visually like should they be that specific in terms of giving guidance for the people um who are sourcing that um these images to help them sort of make sure that they're building a body of imagery that is more inclusive I think so. Yes. I don't think that there's any harm in encouraging people to push the envelope in terms of the images that they've traditionally selected and to think about the reality of the world we live in. Because the reality is that the world we live in here is, is quite diverse. And if you are a brand, um, the chances are that your audience will be quite diverse as a result. Um, in terms of race, ethnicity, gender, whatever the case may be. And 
you want to be able to serve those individuals. And so always think about that. I think everything always comes back to your audience and making sure that they can see themselves reflected in the creatives that you produce. So if your audience is predominantly, let's say women, then you are going to probably have a lot of imagery that reflects women and you can show a diversity of women because, you know, women come in, in quite a range of different uh, races, ethnicities and ages and whatever the case may be. So you should probably analyze your audience to see what it looks like and then put out creative that reflects that audience not only the audience you currently have, but the audience you hope to serve as well. Because I think that's where sometimes brands get mixed up is that they've um, catered to one segment of a population for a very long time. And they're not aware of all the people they're alienating because of their lack of diversity and imagery. And I think that's really important to be aware of it. For sure. Do you have any best practices to offer up? Um with regards to brands who want to build um, a, a nice repository of inclusive stock photography? Yeah, I would say I have a few. <laughs> um, always use photos that actually represent the community you're trying to stir, serve um, instead of adding diversity in for the diversity's sake, because that's tokenism. Nobody wants to be tokenized. <laughs> And then when you're picking photos, you need to think about the context and what your photo is actually being used to portray. Um, you need to be mindful of your own biases as an individual and as a marketer. And if you're not part of a particular community, then you do need to do your research and you do need to consult professionals who are part of that community so you can understand some of the guardrails, some of the negative perceptions or stereotypes that may exist. Because when you examine your creative through an array of diverse lenses um, and include diverse perspectives in that process, it helps uncover blind spots that you may not know you have, which leads to portraying people in a more realistic way, naturally. And I would say never ever use stereotypical imagery, even though it is often convenient. Sometimes I notice marketers are under the gun, under a lot of pressure to get things done quickly. So it's easy to just go to the default easiest selection, but we're not trying to reduce people to caricatures that have existed in the media for decades, right? We're trying to push beyond that and break that boundary. And I would also say a really important thing to do when you're thinking of inclusive imagery is to remember to review it um, not just as the image, but review your creative in its entirety, because images are only one component. The words, the language, sizing, placement, all of those things as well can help um, or can convey different messages to different audiences. So you need to be aware. I would say most importantly, if I had to give one last thing, it's just to know that, you know, just show people interacting and living their daily lives as authentically as possible. The only way that you're going to ever be able to do that is actually understanding your audience, understanding the community that's being portrayed in an image. There's no way around it. I love it. One, such wonderful examples. I know you've got a list of um, some places where people can find um, inclusive stock photography. Before we do that, I just want to ask you one question. Um, I worked with a, cl a client um, last year who wanted to create their stock photography. They wanted their photography to be more representative of the population. So they were trying to, um, what they were measuring was, all right, are the images that we're putting forth, is it do we have the right percentage of women? Do we have the right percentage of black people? Do we have the right percentage of, you know, blah, 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 going on down the line. And um, there were times where this client, and I know this exists quite a bit, where they felt like using a racially ambiguous person helped check a couple of boxes for them on that. And last year, I also did um, a research report on the state of representation in marketing. 
And I asked people what they thought about, um, what they wanted brands to know. And a number of responses came back in the verbatims um, where people talked about the harm they felt brands were causing whenever they wouldn't show um, darker skinned people in their imagery. It always felt like it was a racially ambiguous person or a mixed race person. It was rarely, you know, depending, and this is various people of color, there were black people, there were, you know, other people of color who commented on this and saying like, we come in a broad range of colors um, across all of our cultures. And they were just frustrated that only the lighter skinned culture seemed to be getting represented and this was across the board. So I wonder if you have any thoughts on that and any sort of suggestions that brands should be thinking about as it relates to color or um, use of ranges of people's actual skin tone, um, as well as like just kind of feeling like this person, we don't know what they are. So this kind of works because a lot of people might be able to see themselves reflected in them. Yeah. Well, clearly that didn't work, right? <laughs> Like, it comes down to the intention. I guess without being intimately involved in that situation, it's hard to tell what the intention is. But if the intention is just to um, take this blanket image to try to get everyone to relate to it, that's kind of sounds like a cop out rather than doing the hard work of trying to represent a, a range of identities because there's a range of identities that appreciate your brand that's the hard work to do and if that's your intention then you do the work to make sure that your imagery does have that range of skin tones for example so it always comes down to intention for me and brands that truly have an intention to serve particular communities will do the work to actually serve those communities and make sure they're represented authentically accurately in imagery, in this case, like you can't just put this quote unquote racially ambiguous person in an ad and hope that somehow everyone's going to relate to it because it, if it's almost like you're putting, um, I don't know, I don't know how to, how to say it, but um, I'd rather, I mean, I'm racially ambiguous to some people uh, because I'm, uh, I'm Jamaican and Ojibwe heritage, and oftentimes people don't know what my, you know, race or ethnicity is, what my cultural background is. Um, now, that doesn't mean that if I see a black person in an ad and I see an indigenous person in an ad, I'm going to relate to one or the other more. I'm going to relate to both. If I see a racially ambiguous person in an ad, I'm going to be like, okay. That's just a person. It's not like it's me necessarily. And so ultimately people do want to see themselves reflected in creative. And I think that the research goes to show that. And if you do the work to understand the research and put those images forward, you're not going to get in hot water as often with your, with the communities you're trying to serve. All right. Um, where where should people go if they want to find inclusive stock photography? I know you put together a whole guide on this. I did. So, I mean, I'm glad you asked because that's one of the questions I get most often. And I did put a guide together for that exact reason, which has a list of some of the best websites around that offer, you know, truly inclusive photography that's curated high quality and it celebrates diversity of all kinds so i could give you examples of some sites but if you go to darej.com you're gonna see that list right up there um, on my website for you to go and find um, photos that represent different gender race ethnicity sexuality ability age body type everything so and the good thing about these stock photo sites that I've curated is that it's not just about who's in front of the camera it's also about who's behind the, the lens as well because some of the best photos are actually taken by the communities themselves that they are trying to represent 
So. Absolutely. I will link to that in the show notes so people can access it very quickly. I, I can imagine a lot of people are going to want those resources. So it's super helpful. Um, where can people find you if they want to follow you and learn more about your work? Uh, well, I'm on all social media as at Deira J. So I encourage you to follow me wherever, but I'm definitely pretty active on LinkedIn. So I welcome you to follow me there. And you can also find like the guide that we just mentioned, as well as other inclusive marketing resources that I have on my website at DeiraJ.com. Nice. All right. Any parting words of wisdom for marketers and business leaders who want to be more representative in their with their visual imagery? Yes, I would say just remember that nobody wants to be tokenized when it comes to seeing their communities represented in the, um, the media. Um, people are really looking for authentic portrayals of the true lifestyles and cultures that they have. And so that means as a marketer, when you're putting your creative together, it's just as important to have people look a variety of ways um, as it is to examine what they're doing in those photos, who they're doing it with, and where, when, and why it's happening. Very cool. Dara J, this has been a really insightful conversation. Thanks so much for stopping by and sharing your wisdom and experiences. Thank you so much for having me. Dara J had so many cool things to share, but that combo won't do you any good if you don't take any action. So here's what I'd like you to do. Go and do a quick audit of your brand photography and evaluate whether it is sending the you belong here signal to the people that you want to serve or if it's sending another message that you'd prefer not be sending. As you look at your imagery, consider the following. First off, is the imagery your brand is putting forth reflective of the people that you want to serve? Now, I want you to think about this, um, especially if um, you are a brand where you are the face of the brand, where it's one person. As you're thinking about um, the imagery that you're putting forth, don't just consider um, images of you. Consider all the images, every type of image that is showcased throughout your brand. That can be customer testimonials. That could be people that you feature on your podcast or as expert guests. Um, that could be people that you're collaborating with on Instagram or even people whose content that you're sharing on social media. Every piece of imagery that you're using or you're putting forth within your brand sends a message. So make sure that you evaluate all of that imagery along every part of your customer journey to evaluate whether or not it is truly reflective of the people that you want to serve. Second, um, take note, is the imagery an authentic representation of the people that you want to serve? Or does it perpetuate harmful stereotypes? And the, some of those stereotypes, of course, we talked about um, during our discussion. And third, what are the marketing policies that you want to establish with regard to the visual imagery your brand puts forth that, to ensure that it is consistently inclusive? That way, this is especially important if there's more than one person who is involved with the visual imagery, who's selecting it, who's going to be pulling it, publishing it for you, um, whenever you've got these policies in place that everyone who's touching your brand and the imagery associated with your brand knows um, and they've got these guidelines, um, they'll know what to do and how to represent your brand in a way that is inclusive and makes people feel like they belong. I cover establishing inclusive marketing policies which also of course covers um, inclusive brand imagery, much more in depth in my newly revamped program, Inclusive Brand Academy. Get more details about the program and the transformations you'll get by going through it at inclusivebrandacademy.com. That's it for today's show. If you like this episode, please do share it with a friend and leave a rating and review for it in your podcast player of choice. It, would, it really does go a long way toward helping more people discover the show. Until next time, remember, everyone deserves to have a place where they belong. Let's use our individual and collective power to ensure that more people feel like they do. Thanks so much for listening. Talk soon.